But then we got to that set and it was incredible. The popcorn bags were period. The cords that tie the balloons were according to period. The you chickens, know, the chicken the, sounds the chicken, were real. The chicken <laughs> sound was not happy. <laughs> <laughs> Action. I'm Bradley Cooper. I'm Guillermo del Toro and this is Notes, Notes on, on the, the scene. scene. Yes. Well, I'm not gonna blow the whistle. You didn't do nothing against me. Let's come on now. Come on, I'm not gonna hurt you. This is uh, at the end of the first night at the carnival, Stanton is asked to look for the geek, which is this uh, wild man uh, that, that is out of control and has escaped. And uh, he's given a flashlight and he's told to not approach him and call upon help when he finds him because he's dangerous. So here he is. Hurry! I'll let you in. I think the important thing here is uh, we're establishing this little fella, you know? I remember when, we, when, we, when, the, when the crane was raised, yes. this is one of the moments where we realized just how wonderful the, the carnival view. was. Yes. Yeah, just this depth that you sort of get when you turn on yeah. these lights, it's just invaluable. And this is all practical. This isn't in post. You, you, know, you created this world that we all just uh, inhabited so easily. So, so often you have to use your imagination. Yeah, nothing is digital. Everything's real. Everything on this scene is on movement, as is in the rest of the movie. So what we'll see is we're always mounted on a crane. This is a, a techno. We are always moving. And Same leading moment. him. This is a great shot too, because yes. it, it, he's being led somewhere, which he doesn't even know yet. You go in there. If you see him, push him through. Here, we start with a motif that becomes central to the movie, the circle, which echoes the geek beat in which he will end being drawn to and being attracted to the, the, the geek bit, which appears in the movie, circles and eyes. The wonderful thing from an acting standpoint, where Clifton and myself is not only is the rain outside, but it's inside. You know, Guillermo put a punctured holes in the tent. So as he's going through this labyrinth of a, or maze-like uh, funhouse to try to find the geek, there's just rain constantly falling on him, which uh, is a wonderful detail. I'll meet you on the other side. And here we are again. He's gonna be encircled by this, which is a premonition of the geek pit. And we start including the eyes that are looking at him. We have the um, uh, exterior in the real location and the interior, this is important, is on a set because we could not make all the mechanics work uh, on, the, on the location. One thing we notice in the location is the tents breathe because of the wind on the exterior. They change the pressure. Now we have a bunch of cables. Replicating the, it. Replicating yeah. the breathing of the tent. Mind you, you can see here the crane in action. You know, we start on a wide shot and the techno extends this close. The beauty of the techno is that it doesn't have tracks. So you can be on a wide shot, you don't have to avoid the tracks, and then you can go close enough without a problem. Now this is important because the yeah. The movie, the movies are about mirrors, and we start establishing it from the get-go. Even Funhouse Jack says, "Let the mirror show you who you are yeah. and who, who you will be," and and this is quite literally the first contact with the mirror Stan has, and that his destiny is telling him who he is. He doesn't look very long at that mirror. No, no he's, <laughs> he's not. not ready. He's not, not ready. ready. <laughs> And here's just real quick, this is the, just the specificity of seeing the dripping from his Under hat hand. down, like yes. that kind of thing, is that it's puddling in the top of his hat. It gives it a sort of a realism that, a, that is invaluable. Every, every take, every take, we was, we would, before we rolled, yeah, we stand, right, we'd underneath stand yeah. right underneath the water to yeah. get that droopy hat, really a guy that is weathered 
and also a guy that is used to standing under the rain. So here we have the devil, the same fellow on the outside that is now going to swallow him. And uh, in the fun house, if you watch it carefully, there are uh, all the sins, gluttony, lust, uh, blah, 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 everything that he's going to have during the movie. And he's going to be swallowed into a purgatory after this. Now, uh, in this in this type of scene, we use uh, wh whether an actor is with another actor or, or solo. Part of the gaffering of the movie of that those scenes is done with the flashlight. And uh, Bradley and I have he's very very precise. Being a director and an actor, you can say you know hit the teeth of the devil. And if you see it in the beginning of this scene, he's lighting the the set a little lighting the inside of the mouth and the teeth and all that. We're basically using the actors as gaffers. You know, we would get onto the set and, 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 you know, figuring out, you know, what is telling us how it wants to be. And we would rehearse, you know, and, and Dan, and we would look at him and say, no, 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 don't light it. Don't light it, yeah. No. And this was one of those examples. And, and did the, Precisely this one, yeah. And, and Dan Laus. The, the cinematographer. <laughs> crazy. Yeah. We had Dan had prepared this shot and there was a little bit of light here yeah and both of us is dan take it out yeah. and here's the incredible thing about dan and and we just said what just just do a line just a silhouette of this yeah. ear in the back and then we can like, have it and that was it it was important for several reasons in the movie we choose to have him in the dark a lot and have him shot from behind a lot because this is a character that doesn't change uh, until the last few minutes of the film so we, we knew what he was thinking. And I think it's because of all the prep you did and what the world you created that when you walk into the world, it just starts telling you things. Hey pal, everybody's looking for you. Damn. Well, I'm not gonna blow the whistle. You didn't do nothing against me. This is a wonderful moment. This is one of my yeah. favorite moments in the movie. It is, and it's purely, it's purely cinematic because you have that image and the pulsating tent and he's basically talking to a, a possible permutation of self. And one of the things Bradley does is to find the character, the first step, the first part of that is the voice. When do we first hear, hear his accent, his intonation, his inflection? Yeah, the blah, script blah. tells us because he says you're an Okie with straight teeth. So yeah. then it's about, okay, well, where? And uh, your first instinct was Mississippi in terms of the geography of where he's coming from. And so that we worked on various parts in Mississippi and it was a little bit too melodic. Yes. And then we found Canton, Mississippi and Tim Monica is an incredible dialect coach I've worked with since American Sniper has library and catalogs of all these people, real people that he's interviewed and recorded over the years. And he had this guy from Canton, Mississippi and we both said, that that's the guy. And then, yeah. and then you, you know, it takes months of work. Well, I'm not gonna blow the whistle. You didn't do nothing against me. Let's come on now. Come on. I'm not gonna hurt you. This is a great moment script-wise, because you think, oh, whoa, he's got his own moral compass that is not with society. He was just told to get this guy, the guy who gave first him money. First night, first night. Who gave him money, who's feeding him. And all of a sudden he goes, he, he lets you know that, oh, he doesn't feel that way. He's completely against the system. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he's gonna let this guy go because he did nothing against him. And it's a wonderful, like very quick education to the viewer as to who this person could be. He's already proving that he's an independent thinker, yeah. yeah. Here we are again on the crane, and the crane is pulling back. We're revealing the, the geek in the foreground. This is basically a new introduction to this character. We saw him in the pit first, but now he's repeating a phrase that is, I'm not like this, I'm not like this, you know, which of course will be important dramatically for Stanton. <laughs> And that's great because now he's saying something that he really wants to believe. And this is the first, in this duo, you're seeing the first face. Yes. And he's saying, I'm not like this, telling us in the audience, I'm not like this. When Stanton really is also feeling that, I'm please, I'm not like this. Easy. 
Yeah. So Paul Anderson is playing the geek, and he's he's incredible. I mean, we we lucked out so much. I mean, he, I mean, he did this, and there was actually a wonderful stunt guy who did the fall. But remember, Paul wanted to do it too. We're like, yes. Paul, but you can't do it because he would have hit you. Yes. <laughs> he, <would've, laughs> not- he rehearsed it once. Yeah, said, hey, is it okay? <laughs> that's okay. But the the thing is, is a stunt that looks fluid and easy and quite effortless, but it's actually very gra- hard. grabbing him by the, by the neck and, and picking slamming him. him. It was which, insane. I mean, uh, this is a small gravy. I'm sure this is not the final scene of Avengers, but you know, we obviously are slamming him against a very thin, thin mat. That would be right there, but the mat is removed in post, but still it's an incredibly hard fall because he's grabbing him on an impulse by the neck and then slamming him down. And uh, it, it is it is a small stunt, but not without danger and, and pain. And this is an embarrassment of riches because we have Clem coming Clem in. It was from, really great for Clem with the depth. One of the things that we tried to capture that would uh, have a, sort of a 50s, a 40s, sorry, 30s, 40s feeling, there's always depth in the movie. There's always something happening in the foreground, something happening in the background. There's always planes moving around, you know, all the planes, uh, background, foreground, midground. There's something uh, to look at always. Hi! Hi! Hi, you're gonna kill him! Jesus, kid! This is uh, the first moment of violence we see Stan. And again, it's him going overboard. He was asked to not do anything, just talk to the guy and stop him. And he's beating him a couple of more times than he needs to, which is sort of an omen of what will happen with him later on in the movie. What I love about this moment is he does it in a way that He's done this many times. Yeah, this is not a this is not a moment that that he has to then grapple with with himself. This is us getting to know. It's like oh, and this guy does that. Yeah, it's like so. There's just these these little breadcrumbs that the movie's telling you. Like also be aware, this guy is very dangerous. Yeah, capable. because he's not like his face isn't scrunched. He's not. This is just like you almost killed me. I'm gonna let you know. Like you don't do that. Keep you down, and then we move on. I mean, easy. he's just—it's yeah. very easy. It's a very effortless. That's why the balletic a- aspect to the way he picks him up by the neck and throws him—it's all just so controlled. And we talked about that. Like, yeah. it can't be a martial arts moment. No, but it should have that sort of dance like. But the way he beats e- him also, we talked about a guy that he's used to beating. That's right, and he goes bam. Yep. Bam. Yeah, that's it. One of his best directions was he wanted you wanted me to learn how to box, uh, and there's no boxing scenes. He's not a boxer, but it was just to for a man in 1938 it, how they would have to handle themselves, and yeah. it was it was invaluable. And I became uh, uh, really uh, into it. <laughs> I think the gravity and the weight. Oh, it changed everything. It changed the, the way the he language. stands, positions himself yeah. in in conjunction to other people, uh, the distance, all of that, and it's to me we see it all over the movie. And that is someone that's an animal that's trying to survive in the forest, and you know? and is afraid. Yeah, all the time. It's afraid all the time. And it, what it gives you the the boxing gives you the physicality, and uh, that's something you cannot simulate. You have to. Have you have to have it. it. Yeah. yeah. Hey, you're gonna kill him, Jesus, kid. Oh, jeez, he dead? I don't need no shoe flies in here, Clem. Get him out of here. Another great example to, uh, of the, the, the script, just like, oh, the, the value of human, of human beings in this world. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't need any shoe flies. Get him out of here. It's like, oh, okay. Yeah. So I, I guess we understand what the value of life we, is. We, we, don't, we don't see them be compassionate about the geek or talk about him in human terms. I think that the, the, the beauty of this uh, sequence is that it introduces another layer of the carnival because you have been in the carnival outside and it's all merriment and this and that. And then this introduces the sort of symbolic, heavy, intimate. Uh, and also it's a sort of small, um, uh, it's like a microcosm of the journey that he's going to yes, go. He's completely. about to go through the whole movie. He and it's all done with there. symbols. Yes. Um, and as his, as his attention to detail, Guillermo, for everything is to story. And this is kind of a wonderful two minute little piece that Mini actually journey. is the journey of the movie. And, and I think that the way an actor handles props or wears props tells you if it's period or if, if uh, the actor was dressed by wardrobe. And I love the way you always adjusted the hat. The hat was such a part of his personality. Yeah. The way you handle it in the bus. Those are details that are some of my favorites. You can tell a person wearing a costume and a person wearing 
clubs. And because Guillermo and all of his crew create the world that is so um, real, um, the truth is those things just start to happen. Um, it's not really things I think about. I mean, the, the putting the handkerchief in his hat was something my grandfather did. So we, we spoke about that. And I thought, you know, I, that always moved me too. Um, and so that was a wonderful little detail. But like, for example, he would always do this thing. Yeah. And that just happened. That, that just happened. And I, and I would just repeat it. And he does it throughout the whole movie every time he puts his hat on. Uh, and the, you sort of wish for little things like that to occur as an actor. And I think it's because Guillermo had set the stage in such a way, all of us, all of the, the wonderful actors that are in this movie, uh, I think discovered those sort of things by the nature of just doing it and not premeditated. I like it. Checking the gate.